He was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. And by his stripes, we are healed. Hello, I'm David Diga Hernandez, and welcome to Spirit Church. Today, I'm gonna to be talking to you about healing, and more specifically, the four obstacles, the four primary obstacles that many face when it comes to receiving their healing. We're gonna take a look at these one at a time and pray that the Lord would cause the truth to set you free with me as usual is Stephen Moctezuma. He's gonna lead you in some worship, and then we're gonna come right back with this lesson. Well, I pray that you enjoyed that worship with Stephen Moctezuma. Now I want to get to the lesson, the four obstacles to healing. And these are, categorically speaking, four obstacles that will prevent you from receiving the healing that God wants to give to you. Now, before I really get into the details of this lesson, I do have to preface this by acknowledging that this is, in fact, a very sensitive topic um, for many reasons which are likely obvious to you. But one of the things that I was most concerned about was coming off as presumptuous when dealing with such sensitive issues. So I want to preface that by saying a couple things. Number one, I believe that any doctrine that doesn't account for or take into account the sovereignty of God is a very dangerous doctrine. So though I do make bold proclamations uh, concerning healing or concerning the covenant of healing or concerning God's will to heal, which I admit I have a very, very extreme view on this and me personally I, I'm one who will never preach that it's not God's will to heal 
And that's just my my own conviction. I can't even say specifically that um, you know I, I would consider others wrong for not preaching that. But to me, I see my job as an evangelist to preach salvation to the lost and healing to the sick. Now, it's up to God what He wants to do in response to the message that I preach. But as far as what my declaration is going to be, it's going to be what I see in the Scripture, and I believe that it is God's will to heal. I don't apologize for that. I'm not going to move from that. I'm not even willing to debate that necessarily unless someone can come with Scripture and really demonstrate otherwise. Now, having said that, I do want to be sensitive to those of you who are facing sickness in your own life and and those who have a loved one who is facing sickness, and maybe you're not seeing the results that you think you should be seeing. So, before I say anything, I did want to acknowledge that this is, in fact, a very sensitive topic, and I do want to acknowledge that there are, in fact, many views on this topic. The other thing I want to talk about was, number two, we have to learn to interpret truth, not necessarily by our experience, but by what the Word of God tells us. So, for example, I've often talked to people who say, well, I've sought God with all my heart and He didn't respond. Well, the Scripture says, let God be true and every man a liar. And Jeremiah chapter 29, I think it's verse 11 or verse 13 says, if you seek me with all your heart, you'll find me. So, God has promised that anyone who seeks Him with all of their heart, is going to find him. So when someone comes up to me and says, well, I sought God with all of my heart and I didn't find him, it's not because God didn't tell the truth. It's because that person didn't really seek God with all their heart like they thought they did. Now, again, that isn't specifically to do with healing, but that's an example of what I mean when I say that we should interpret truth not through our experience, but through the Word of God. So we have to make room for God's sovereignty. We have to make room for God's wisdom. We can't Yet I can't, I can honestly tell you, we're never really going to fully understand everything that God is doing, at least while we're here upon the earth. As far as what later revelation may come, the scripture doesn't necessarily promise understanding about every little detail, but the scripture does talk about a fullness and a maturity that comes when we move into the eternal realm. So, first of all, again, I acknowledge this is a sensitive topic. Number two, we must acknowledge God's sovereignty. And number three, we have to learn to interpret scripture through scriptural truth, and not just our own experience. So, if you're listening to this, it is not my intention to discourage anyone. It is not my intention to make it seem as though anyone is not spiritual enough to be healed. On the contrary, I don't think it has to do with being spiritual, but there are, in fact, other obstacles. So, when it comes to the question, why aren't some healed, I'm just going to be honest with you. I personally believe that it is God's will to heal every time, but the times that it doesn't happen, I'm just going to say it. The scripture doesn't give us any specific details on this, and therefore I'm just going to have to conclude, though I normally do, you've heard me in the past give very specific answers to questions like these. When it comes to this, I can give you my opinion, but the scripture does leave room for the sovereignty of God. So I can't account for every single instance, and I'm not going to pretend I can. Maybe someday down the line, I'll I'll have studied the scripture even more and come to a more firm grasp on the topic. But as of right now, We just have to learn that the answer to some of our questions is that we just need to trust God. And so if you're watching this and you're believing God for healing in your body, you're watching this, you've had a loved one who died because they didn't receive a healing in their body, or you have a loved one who is praying for a healing in their body, I want to encourage you that the Bible does promise healing. And I don't want to discourage you either as I go through these obstacles. I don't bring these to your attention to shame you. I bring these to your attention because maybe, in fact, one of these obstacles is preventing you from receiving your healing. So, to put it simply, maybe one of these four things is preventing something that God wants to do in your life. Now, at the end, I'm going to talk about what happens after you've gone through this kind of checklist and you still don't see the results that you want to see. I'm going to touch on that a little bit at the end. But as you're listening, just remember, my goal is not to discourage anyone. My goal is to, to tackle this topic with as much sensitivity as possible. But I have to be loyal to the truth that I found in Scripture. So, number one, the number one obstacle to healing, you probably already know it, is doubt. Mark chapter 6, verse 4 through 6 says this, Then Jesus told them, A prophet is honored everywhere, except in his own hometown, and among his relatives, and his own family. And because of their unbelief, verse 5 says, and because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed 
at their unbelief. So we have to be humble and acknowledge that it's possible that we don't have the faith that we think we do. I know people who have you know, been very upset with me, especially uh, when I'm preaching a message this bold. They, they get very upset with me. Well, well, you don't know my, 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 my family member. You don't know my friend. You don't know my, my, and they'll name someone they're connected to. They'll say, they had faith. How dare you say? And you know, I, 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 I listen to them and I hear them and I understand that. I personally have known people who I've cared about who didn't receive the healing in the manner in which they wanted to receive it or in the timing in which they wanted to receive it. But I must acknowledge that the scripture teaches that one of the obstacles that may be preventing your healing is doubt. Jesus couldn't do the miracles because of their unbelief. The key word here is faith. So we have to understand that the problem, before we rush and say, well, let's change our doctrine against what the Bible says, we have to acknowledge that it's possible that maybe the problem is not with the word, but it's with us. Now, I'm not saying everyone who isn't healed has doubt. As on the contrary, I'm going to list three other things right now. But we have to at least be humble enough to assess this, at least take it off the checklist, at least pass this checkpoint, at least try this and see if this isn't the issue. Because some people are so concerned and so defensive about their spiritual standing that they won't even consider that this is a possibility. And because they won't consider that a possibility, maybe, just maybe, they're missing out on a healing because of doubt. I know it's humbling. I know it's challenging. But possibly, it could be that you're not healed because you do have doubt. Now, again, I recognize this could sound cruel, but, but remember, we're going to go down the checklist. And if you notice I'm being extra sensitive here, it's, because it's, it's not because I'm nervous about what people say. You know me. I'm very bold about what I believe. But on this one, I don't want to lose anyone right up at the top. I want you to follow me all the way through here until the end and let's see if at least we can check these off the list and see if we can just then trust in the sovereignty of God. So number one, it's doubt. Now there always has to be faith present for a healing to occur. In Luke chapter 7 verse 1 through 10, we see that the centurion had faith on behalf of his servant and Jesus sent the word to the centurion's servant who was under the centurion's authority. We see in Mark 5, Jairus' daughter is healed. Now, Jairus', Jairus daughter was dead, so she wasn't really around to have any faith. But Jairus had faith in Jesus on behalf of his daughter. We also see in Mark 5 that the woman ha who had an issue of blood had faith for herself to be healed. She said within her heart, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I can be made whole. She recognized that. And so, in each of these instances, even with Lazarus, someone had to have faith to cause the miracle to occur. So number one, at least assess it. Don't get down on yourself. Don't discourage yourself. Don't beat yourself up. Don't, 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 you know, loathe in the misery. Just recognize maybe it is doubt. And if it is, ask the Lord to reveal it to you. Check it off your list and move on. Don't let the enemy bombard you with thoughts and, and discouragement and, and depression that would set in because you feel you don't have any faith. In fact, it's very easy to get faith and belief is a lot more than we think it is. I mean, a lot easier to come by than we think it is. Jesus didn't say you need an ocean of faith. He said you need a mustard seed. So it's a little bit of faith that's required to have on your part, but you have to move in faith. You cannot come to him in doubt. In fact, James 1 says, when you come to him, you can't waver. You can't be tossed by the waves. You have to focus and you have to be single-minded and know that he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ask or think and claim it in faith believing. So number one, one of the obstacles to healing is doubt. Number two, now this is really going to get intense. Number two, one of the obstacles to healing is demonic beings or demons. So number one is doubt. Number two is demons. Now, Sickness in our world is a result of the fallen state of man. It also may result, I mean, you think about the way, I mean, greed kind of just drives everything. I mean, even the food industry has completely changed. Many of the things that we, we interact with because of the advancements of technology, I mean, I'm talking about the foods, I'm talking about the diets, I'm talking about the way the food is prepared. A lot of diseases come because of the way man has 
take in the industry with with our diet. So that's one reason. But but other than that, I mean, we're talking about a fallen world here. We're talking about a sin sick world, and it is dying. It's decaying. It's 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 going away. Everything's tending toward disorder. Paul the apostle even talks about how though the flesh is dying, I'm going to be resurrected. That's the hope we have. And then you really get down to it. I mean, everyone Jesus healed in the Gospels, their body is in the grave somewhere now. They're, they're dust. They've returned to the earth. So not even the ones that Jesus healed walked in that health for eternity until they stepped onto the other side. So we are going to face death. Our bodies do break down. But but there, so, so to balance this out here, some sickness is caused by demonic beings. So demons cause sickness, but not all sickness is demonic. However, I am more convinced as time goes on, the longer I'm in the healing ministry, the more I grow to hate sickness. And the more I just begin to despise the works of the enemy. I cannot, I cannot be brought to even think that that's God's will. I just don't see it. It doesn't, God, God is a, when he created us, that was not his intention for man. I see sickness as something so destructive as a result of sin, as a result of living in the natural world, and sometimes as a result of demonic beings. I know this is controversial, but this is what the scripture says. First John chapter 3, verse 8. But when people keep on sinning, it shows that they belong to the devil, who has been sinning since the beginning. But the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. Now Mark chap- or Matthew chapter 8, verse 16 says, When the evening was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the evil spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. Again, we see demons correlated with, with terrible works that destroy us. And so also in Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, Jesus called his 12 disciples together and gave them authority to cast out evil spirits and to heal every kind of disease and illness. So they're able to heal the sick by casting out devils. Matthew chapter 9, verse 32 to 33. As they went out, behold, they brought to him a, a dumb man, it means he couldn't speak, possessed with a devil. And when the devil was cast out, the dumb spake. And the multitudes marveled, saying, It was never, it, it was never so seen in Israel. Matthew chapter 12, verse 22 says, Then was brought unto him one possessed with the devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. So we see here demons causing sickness. I won't read the whole entire context, but Mark chapter 9, verse 14 through 29, the scripture talks about a man who brings his son to the disciples, and they're they're not able to cast out the devil from that man's son. And so the disciples are wondering what's going on here. Jesus gets there, and he's so frustrated with the disciples, he says, you have so little faith. He rebukes them. Why? I mean, just it was just the chapter before that he transfigured on the mountaintop. They saw him in all his glory, and now they can't even cast a devil out of a little boy. And so Jesus gets on the scene. He casts the devil out. When the devil came out of him, that boy had a, a, a spirit of epilepsy, that, or a spirit that caused epilepsy, and seizures and, and, and such. And so when Jesus took the demon out of the boy, when he cast it out, the boy was healed. So we have to acknowledge that the scripture teaches that in some cases, demonic beings are causing sickness. Let me tell you something about demons real quick. I mean, I have seen some of the weirdest things in the church world. We're talking people who want to cast out devils in like, they make it almost like it's a psychiatry appointment. You come back every Friday night, maybe from six to seven, from six to seven, we'll have a deliverance session and, and we'll cast out a demon over a period of several weeks and we'll go, I'm going to say treat people like onions. We'll peel back layer after layer after layer and we'll pray over each year, each month of your birth and we'll go back to when you were seven, when you were three, we'll pray over it. And look, I understand the intention. I know people love people who do it that way. But honestly, I just don't see that in the scripture. When dealing with demonic beings, if the demonic being doesn't respond right when you speak the word, it can be only one of really a few things. Number one, the person may not really even be demonically influenced or possessed. Maybe they are are, are paranoid or emotionally stirred to believe such things. Uh, number two, it could be that um, it needs to come out through prayer and fasting. But after you've exhausted those two, after if the demonic force has not responded after prayer and fasting, and if the demonic force have, hasn't responded after that, then it's either that the person is not really demon-possessed and that's it. 
I mean, you, can, you can't really get around it there. That's a, the logical progression is such that the scripture says the only time that the disciples couldn't cast one out is when Jesus said, this kind comes out through prayer and fasting. So if the demon doesn't come out, it's because it needs to come out through prayer and fasting or the person isn't really demon possessed. Now I say that because some people get discouraged. They pray and pray and pray and rebuke and rebuke and rebuke. And it seems like nothing's working. Demon, The demon's not listening. They get pastors and ministers. And I've come to realize that in many cases, it's just the mind. They've convinced themselves they're demonic, they're demonically influenced or possessed when all it is is that they need to get their emotions in order. They need to overcome their fear. They need to overcome their depression, which can be leveraged by demonic beings, but doesn't always necessarily cause directly by demonic beings. So when it comes to casting out devils, when it comes to casting out demons and spirits and, and such, we have to realize that demons, if the person really is demonically influenced, will respond to the word, will respond to the command. And if it doesn't come out through the first command or through prayer and fasting, then it's something else entirely. So don't get discouraged and say, well, I've prayed and prayed and prayed and I'm still sick. If that's the case, then it's not a demonically influenced sickness. So you can check that off the list. So number one, doubt. Number two, demons. And number three, delusions. These are misconceptions. I'll never forget. I was praying for a lady. Oh man, I don't, re I don't even remember where I was ministering. And I'm ministering to this lady. She has, she was, I believe it was blindness in her left eye. So she comes up, she's in the prayer line. And I, this is when I used to pray individually for each person, but the prayer lines have gotten so long recently that it would take hours and hours. And, um, you know, everyone wants to tell you their story and always want to make sure to hear the person out. But so I stop and I, 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 I'm listening to this lady's story. She's telling me about what she has to deal with. So I said, okay, let's pray. She goes, no, 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 I need you to hear the whole story. And sometimes people think I have to hear it all in order for God to move. So I just respected her and I wanted, you know, I, I'm of the belief that everyone deserves to be heard no matter who they are. So I stopped and I listen and she begins to tell me more. I say, okay, let's pray. I grab her by the hands. I say, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke this blindness. I ask you to heal this woman. And, and as I'm rebuking her blindness, she goes, no, 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 no. She goes, I'm not blind. I go, oh, oh I'm sorry. I, must, I, I misunderstood you then. I said, I apologize. Uh, please tell me, what are we praying for? So I'll pray for my eye. I want to see out of my left eye. I said, okay. I, said, I got a little confused. So I keep praying. And then she goes, she goes okay, we prayed. And, and then we again and again, back and forth with this. And then she goes again. No, 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 I don't have blindness. I said, okay, but we're praying for your eye so you could see out of it. Yes, I said, can you see out of your eye? Yes, I can. I said, okay, so God healed you. Yes, he did. So I tested it, she can't see, and I'm just so confused. And then until I finally realized that she's of the belief that if she says it, it's gonna make it worse. And I don't know, I do believe that life and death are in the power of the tongue, but there's, there's a line you draw with superstition and true spirituality. And, and she was up there saying, I mean, it was confusing me the whole time. And she's saying, well, I don't need a healing in my eye. I said, great, you're healed. She goes, no, pray for it because I still can't see. And so it went like that. It was like an Abbott and Costello kind of routine. It just went on and on and on. So after about 20 minutes of trying to understand this, I realized she just wasn't, she, she didn't understand what faith really was. And so she's professing all these strange things. And, and so I go, I go, lady, listen, if you're in a line for healing, you're acknowledging that you need a healing. If you need a healing, it means there's a sickness. Admitting that you're sick is not the same as, as declaring that you're sick or, or giving room to the devil. No, you have to be clear for communication's sake that God wants to heal you. Now, I remember also this other lady, I called her out and I, I, I saw a lady and, and I said, ma'am, I don't know who you are, and I forgot specifically what sickness it was, but it was something to do with one of her internal organs. And I said, there's a problem with this internal organ. I see it in the spirit. She goes, oh, no, 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 I, I don't have that problem. And I go, I, I didn't back down because I know the voice of the Holy Spirit. I said, no, no, no. I said, you have a problem with an internal organ. And, and then I think the pastor was trying to help me. I think he thought I missed it. And he said something to the effect of, well, maybe she doesn't know that she's sick. I go, no, 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 she knows. This woman knows. I go, ma'am, I am not trying to embarrass you, but if you will step out in faith right now, God wants to heal you. And she's just kept with me for about two minutes. She's fighting me. No, no, I'm not sick. I'm not sick. Finally, she starts breaking down crying, and she admits to me that she didn't want to profess it or declare it. I, and I, I didn't understand that. And I'm not frustrated with these people. I'm frustrated with the devil who puts these weird ideas in people, I call them delusions, that prevent them from receiving healing. I was in Chicago doing a miracle service there, and this woman is on the front row. She's got her walker. I want to pray for her. I said, ma'am, can I pray for you? She says, no, no, I don't want to receive prayer. 
I said, okay, no problem. I didn't want to force anything on her. But then she goes on to explain her reason to me. She says, I don't want to receive prayer because there are people here who need healing more than I do. I thought, well, that's, that's, that's noble. I said, but, but ma'am, God is eternally supplied and eternally powerful. He's not running short on miracles in heaven. Everyone here can receive their healing. And she, when I told her that, she got up and left the service. She got very angry with me. But these are strange delusions, misconceptions that people have. Um, they said, God should still heal someone else. Or, or I'm already healed. Or God is testing me. Or, or this, my sickness gives God the glory. I think it's um, John chapter 9, verse 3, where people get that idea from. So John chapter 9, verse 3 the, the scripture says, yes, this is it. It says, it was because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. Or it was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. That's referring to a man who came for healing and people said, who, who sinned to make this man sick? Jesus said, nobody sinned, but it happened so that God could be glorified. But notice, it's not the sickness that brought glory to God. It was the miracle that brought glory to God. So these weird misconceptions and delusions we have to be rid of if we're going to have the mind of Christ to receive what God wants to do. So number one is doubt. Number two is demons. Number three, delusions. Number four, debasement or sin. Now I know we just read in John chapter 9 verse 3 that that man in his case, nobody had sinned. And Jesus was saying this was not because of sin. In that instance in scripture, yes, that's true. He was not sick because of sin. He was sick because of something else. But the issue here is that it's not always the case. Many times you'll find things in Scripture that seems to, seem to contradict. It's not that it's a contradiction. It's that it's a different case. It's a different scenario. It's not God doing something different. Like people, you know, talk about grace, and then some people talk about, uh, you know, liberalism and legalism and the difference between the two. And you can find arguments really on both sides. But we have to learn to balance Scripture with Scripture. So just because you see something happening in one instance and not in the other, it doesn't mean that there's a contradiction. It means that it's, there's, there's a principle at work that's different in each scenario. So in Acts chapter 5, verse 1 through 11, Ananias and Sapphira, their sin caused God to kill them. The Holy, they, they were dead. I mean, I wrote this, I remember, this was a while ago, maybe like six years ago. And this is when I was a little more eager and I used to, to get into online battles with people and, you know, debate and theology. And I realized there's not really much fruit that comes from that. So I, I kind of stay out of that now. Um, but back then I was very ambitious to just, you know, let, let's spread the word, let's help people believe, let's 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 break the mindsets that keep them bound. And so I, I, I did, I was a little mischievous then, I got into this thread and I saw all these people posting about, you know, the, the hyper grace and how God doesn't, that the judgment of God is completely done away with. There are people who think that, that you know, they equate judgment with criticism and they're not even the same, or judgment with being rude and they're not even the same. Judgment is simply, a decision or an assessment made on some objective standard. In this case, God's moral law, God's written law to the church, um, church principles. So we make judgments every day. Everybody makes judgments every day. You can't escape it. We're all going to do it, and it's not wrong in and of itself. Um, you, some people reference Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 through 6, where Jesus is saying, Judge not, lest ye be judged. But just like four verses later, he says, so If you want to judge, first remove the beam from your eye, and then you can remove the speck from your brothers. But he's giving us a standard by which we should judge. And Jesus said, Judge with righteous judgment. But anyway, so I get on there, and I'm just watching this thread, and they're all talking about how God's never judging anyone anymore. It's all just, just laughs and happiness and, you know, strolls to the park. And so I get on there, and I'm looking... And they ask, they say, name one instance in the New Testament where, where someone is judged. And I said, Ananias and Sapphira. And I, all I did was post the verse. I said, Ananias and Sapphira posted the verse. And man, that thread just blew. I think I had like 40, 50 comments within just a couple minutes. And people were just so angry that I, I posted a verse. And I, I knew what I did. I, like I said, I was being mischievous, a little more mischievous back then. And, and I actually saw a guy, he got on there. He says, well, the Bible doesn't say that God killed them. Maybe they both had heart attacks. And he was that fixed on his view that he was trying to do away with it with that. And I share that. To, it's a funny situation. But, but the truth is that sin does cause these things. Ananias and Sapphira sin. They lied against the Holy Spirit and they were struck down. That's New Testament, guys. That's the church age, okay? Proverbs chapter 14, verse 30. This is not metaphoric. It talks about how some sickness causes, it's like a cancer to the bones. And it's not metaphoric because in the first portion, it talks about how joy is health. So 
Also in 1 Corinthians, actually, I'm going to read this one. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, this one blew me away when I saw it. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27 to 31. This is what the scripture says. So anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. This is talking about communion. Verse 28. This is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. Verse 30. This is why many of you are weak and sick, and some have even died. Yeah, I know. That blew me away too when I read it. That's New Testament, guys. Sin can cause sickness. I'll use the same anecdote that I use when referencing the demons. Sin can cause sickness, but not all sickness is caused by sin, as we saw in John chapter 9, verse 3. So doubt, demons, deception, or, you know, these delusions, or debasement, which is sin. So if you can check all of these things off on your list, I only bring these to your attention because I want you to be healed. If you can check all these things off your list, and you know it's not any of those things by Scripture, by the Spirit, and you really search yourself. Be like King David. Search me, O God. Remove anything that's, that's, that's not of you. I don't want this to linger over your mind. I don't want this to bug you and keep you up at night because God's merciful, and, and the Holy Spirit is very clear. And some of us, we get so paranoid. I'm telling you, many of us, we just overthink. I, I, I receive so many calls for prayer every day, and oftentimes, I'm telling you, for the most part, it's just that Christians overthink things and they work themselves up with fear and anxiety, all of these things that really just destroy the mind. And that's not God's will for you. So you, you, you'll you know God will reveal these things. You know if there's sin in your life. You know if there's doubt in your heart. You know if there's a demonic influence. You know if there's, there's delusions that you're believing. Well, not that one per se, but now that I brought it to your attention, maybe the, light, the light's been shined there. But... When it comes to these things, it's not difficult to deal with them. Once you've acknowledged that it's a possibility and you assess yourself, you ask the Lord, and if you find that it's none of those things, then move on and just trust the Lord and trust in His sovereignty. I'm telling you, I can't answer why God doesn't heal us all. I, I cannot give you that answer. That's not up to me to give. My job is to pray for the sick and to preach healing and to expose some of these obstacles. I mean, I can give you an example, 1 Timothy 5.23, where instead of Paul the Apostle healing Timothy, he tells him to drink a little wine, in this case it's medicine, for his stomach. Acts chapter 3, there's a man at the gate, beautiful, that if you really take a look at all of the details of it, it's very likely that this same man who was healed in Acts 3 was passed up by Jesus every time Jesus passed by that gate. King David, oh my goodness, look at this, King David himself prayed for healing. And it didn't come right when he wanted to see it. So look in Psalm chapter 6. Did you know that? That King David prayed for himself to be healed and wasn't responded to right away? Psalms is a big book, so I got a lot to flip through. But Psalm chapter 6, verse 2 through 3 says this. He says, Have compassion on me, Lord, for I am weak. Heal me, Lord, for my bones are in agony. I am sick at heart. How long until you restore me? So he's talking about he's sick in heart. I don't think he means his physical heart there. I think he's talking about his soul. But then just above that, he's talking about his bones being in agony. And then look at this in Psalm chapter 30, verse number 2. The scripture tells us where he finds his healing. So now he's rejoicing in verse 2. O Lord my God, I cried to you for help, and you have restored my health. But again we see in Psalm chapter 35 that King David actually prayed for others to be healed, and they weren't healed. Psalm chapter 35 verse 13 says this, Yet when they were ill, I grieved for them. I denied myself by fasting for them, but my prayers returned unanswered. So we see in Scripture just a few examples of people who weren't healed as we thought they should be healed traditionally. Now, the way I've reconciled this, and this, this works logically, it doesn't, there are two ways to reconcile things like this. There's an emotional way, then there's a logical way. Me, I'm a logical person, so I'm going to tell you how it's worked for me. Perhaps by coming to a logical conclusion, you can find emotional peace through it. But this is, a, this is the best explanation I've found in Scripture. And it may seem like a bit of a cop-out, but I want you to really think about this. 
everyone eventually who follows Christ is healed. Just not on this side of eternity. So when you look at the scriptures that promise healing, they do come. I think when it comes to people who aren't healed, I think the main issue, and I think where God's sovereignty comes into play, is when it has specifically to do with the timing of the healing. Like I said, we saw that man in Acts, in Acts 3, the gate beautiful, that was the timing of his healing, but he was still healed. So all of us will have these bodies decay and die. That doesn't mean that God doesn't want to heal some of us on this side for the sake of the gospel. And next week, I'm going to be talking to you about the three reasons God heals. But that is how I've reconciled it in my mind. Now that, you, you, there really is no way around it because there are no contradictions there. But to some of us, we may look at it and go, well, that doesn't really help me emotionally. I mean, I, I logically, it makes sense and it connects all the dots. There's no contradictions. The whole, it's got the best explanatory scope from Genesis to Revelation. You put that explanation in there and it fits. It's really the only one that fits all the way around. But then there are those who are just struggling and it's not that they want to understand it intellectually. It's that they need help coping with it emotionally. Well, number one, I want to encourage you. I believe God wants to heal you. And I want to give you that hope because the scripture gives it to you. Let's believe God for your healing. Let's ask the Lord to reveal these things. So, Father, I pray in Jesus' name for that one watching. Lord, that the healing power of God would begin to flow. Father, you've exposed the things that prevent us from receiving healing. And so, Father, I ask right now in the name of Jesus that as this anointing flows, you would cause bones to be healed and muscles to be healed and organs. And, and Lord, I rebuke skin diseases and brain diseases and, and problems with the eyes and with the ears and with the mouth and with the nose. Lord, let all senses be restored. Let all systems be restored. You formed the body and surely you can heal, heal it. Lord, I thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit now moving here. I give you the glory, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. And I want you to say, Amen. Well, I hope that this helped bring some things to light. Again, I wanted to bring some things to your attention without causing you to feel condemned. And I've, I've, I've hopefully I've done that successfully. Uh, you know I'm not normally this sensitive when approaching a topic, but for this one, I wanted to make an exception um, in, in doing that. So now I want to take this moment to welcome the new members of Spirit Church. There you are up on the screen. Those are your names, your places. Thank you for joining. Welcome to the Spirit family. We are praying for you, and we sure do love you. I want to encourage you now, if this is your church, to make sure you submit your tithes and your offering at this moment. If you're in the app, you're going to have to go and manually type in the URL or the link. If you're not in the app, then you're going to have a link that's going to appear that you can actually click on. But I love you guys, praying for you. Maybe you're not a part of the Spirit family, but you do watch these videos regularly, or you watch Encounter TV on television, or you've come to the events, or experienced the power of God, or the presence of God, or the Word of God through many of our other ministry outreaches. And I want to encourage you, go ahead and just sow a one-time gift, um, a monthly gift. Everything you sow into the ministry helps us with worldwide television, international events, and global discipleship. Well, that's it for this edition of Spirit Church. Until next time, remember, nothing is impossible with God.